Hello everyone, welcome to the show. My name is Amanda Ostrander. I am a teacher turned homeschool mom and this is Raising A to Z, a place where we talk about all things homeschooling. And today I'm gonna to talk about all things homeschool co-ops. So I post often on my Instagram about going to co-op. We are a part of co-op that we love. And whenever I post about co-ops, I get tons of DMs. What is this co-op? How do you find a co-op? What do you guys do at your co-op? How much does a co-op cost? Where do we find one? Like I get so many questions. And so I thought I would do kind of a homeschool co-op 101 video for you guys today. We'll answer a couple things about co-ops and how they work. There's two different kinds of co-ops. There is a social co-op and there is an academic co-op. Social co-ops from my experience tend to be more common in our Ontario area um, because Typically they involve less work and less planning. And so they tend to be a little bit more common, a little bit more popular. They're a little bit more feasible for people to put together. Not that academic co-ops are not feasible. They just involve a little extra planning. So you really do need to have at least one person kind of at the helm who is able to organize everybody. And not everybody has that gifting. So, um, there are different co-ops. Some are very social co-ops where basically the goal is to meet on a regular basis and have the kids form connections and friendships, let the parents form connections and friendships in the homeschooling community and get together on a regular basis. Very much the goal is to socialize. Then you will have an academic co-op where there is still very much a social aspect, but there's also a teaching group learning aspect as well. So there's two different formats of academic co-ops that I've seen. Um, the first one is they pick a curriculum. So for example, they might pick like a unit study from the good and the beautiful. And they're like, okay, every time we meet for the whole term, we're going to be learning about, let's say they're doing the space unit. And every time they get together, either one parent is teaching a lesson or the parents take turn teaching whatever the next lesson in the curriculum might be. That is kind of an example of one academic style of co-op where they've chosen a curriculum as a group and that is what they're doing. The other option of academic co-op that I've seen is that basically every parent takes a turn. And so on week one, I don't know, Amy is teaching and she's going to teach on whatever lesson she wants to teach. Uh, week two, it's going to be Sarah. Week three, it's going to be Amanda. Week four, it's going to be Laura. Like they're just going through and everyone teaches whatever they want to teach. And so typically parents will teach to their strengths. So some might be more science-based because they're more scientifically inclined. Some might be more art-based. Some might have a really great like love of poetry. And so they're gonna teach a poetry unit or a class or whatever, like it, it varies. Um, and so that would be like another kind of a bit more lax um, form of an academic co-op. But there is, again, that is the goal is teaching and group learning. Social co-ops are more common because basically you guys just have to agree to meet at a certain location at a certain time. Um, academic co-ops, you do need to have an understanding that everybody in the group is going to help. Everyone's going to participate and they all need to agree on a certain set of parameters, whether that is we all, we're all going to use the same curriculum. We're all going to read the same book for novel study this week. We're all going to do like whatever it is. And so there just needs to be a little bit more of a agreement and harmony in the parents in that group. Um, and all agreeing to use the same things, which sometimes you'll have like, is not always an option. Like in a social group, you could have a wide, much wider variety of homeschoolers in a social group um, versus an academic, because basically you kind of all have to be similarly academically inclined when you're doing an academic group. But there's neither one is wrong. They're just different styles of co-ops. I'm personally a member of a more social co-op. Not that I have anything against academic co-ops. It's just A, there aren't any here and B, that's just a lot of organizing for someone who's already very busy to organize myself. So it is what it is. And there's nothing, like I said, nothing wrong with either one. Just one involves a little bit more organizing or at least having one parent who's on top of getting people to do what things need to be done to do the teaching part. It's just one extra step, but really they're very similar. And often in an academic, it'll be like a one hour lesson and then like a one hour playtime or something like that. So there's still very much a social aspect, but there's this like teaching aspect first. How often do co-ops meet? This varies greatly. 
So when I first started homeschooling, there was a co-op in our area that was a teaching co-op and it met once a month, which is a little bit more doable when you're doing a teaching co-op. And they were doing like the everyone teaches a lesson a week kind of thing. So like you had 10 families, you taught one lesson a year. It, it was a little bit more doable um, compared to like if you're doing a weekly meetup and you had to teach a lesson every 10 weeks, which is three or four times a year. Um, that can be a little bit more overwhelming, especially for parents who are nervous about it. So that one met once a month. Our social co-op meets once a week. So it really depends on the availability of your group. It depends on what you guys want to do, what your goals are. Some co-ops are meeting for a full day. Like when it's a once a month, maybe you are meeting for a full day or like four or five hours. Um, but typically if you're meeting more frequently than that, I'm, I'm noticing that like two to three hours is kind of the average of where of how long people are meeting so that would be like a good chunk of a morning most of an afternoon um we meet from one till technically it's one to three but most of us leave around 3 30 so we're doing like two and a half hours a week co-op like i said it very very much depends on what the group is and the setup of the group but typically I'm, I'm, that's what i'm noticing where do we meet so there again this is going to vary widely depending on the co-op. So we have seen co-ops that meet like regularly in one person's house if they have the room and the space to meet. Um, we've I've seen co-ops where it was like a house share. So every week, um, especially if it was like an academic co-op where you were like every week was teaching when it was at your house, you taught. Um, so like I've seen that. We've seen people who have like they rent a library space they rent um, a community center a, ch a room at a church um that's what we started with our current co-op started in a church like renting a room in a church on a one day a week and now we've actually moved to a bigger um, community clubhouse so it's like a private neighborhood association kind of thing um, and they have a clubhouse on this really nice little piece of land. And so we rent that out and use it once a week. There's a lot of options. I actually have even heard of a co-op that was an outdoor co-op that just um, park hopped. So it had like a routine, like a, a list of local parks that it would go to. So and like, so it had like parks, hiking trails, beaches, soccer fields, like it was just all outdoor locations within the city. So that is also an option. You can have a, a traveling co-op if you want. Um, so it really depends on what is available and what you guys can do feasibly. So like, because we rent a, a clubhouse, we have to pay dues to use it, obviously. Whereas if you're meeting at parks on a regular basis, you don't have to pay for that. So speaking about paying dues, what is the cost? Again, this is gonna depend most greatly on where you're meeting and if you're buying curriculum or not. So because we rent a building, it's a small clubhouse building, we have two options in terms of payment. Number one is we can pay $40 a term. So a term is four months, September. Yeah, I think our current term is four months and then we usually do like three month terms in the, in the new year. Um, so it works out to be about 10 bucks a month. We can pay it all at once, like an upfront cost. So I paid $40 from now until December. Or for the families who can only come out like once in a while, because we do have some families who are just like, we just can't make it that often. Um, they can do like a $5 drop in and they just pay $5 when they show up. Um, so that's what we do. That's the our cost. We have a crazy good deal with the neighborhood decisions. I wanna say we ch they charge us 100 or 150 bucks a month to rent the space. Um, because no one uses it during the day. So uh, we get a crazy good deal. And so all the money collected, because you're like, that sounds like a lot of money, uh, $40 times at least 10 families. That's like $400. The cost that we pay, any extra goes into um, any supplies that we might need. Though, although like we often kind of just pool supplies, like I need this, you bring that. Um, we get a lot of stuff like donated to us that we use. Like we had one year, we had a friend who donated a ton of like card stock and the kids make Christmas cards and Valentine's cards and we're still going to use that stockpile of Christmas cards and Valentine's stuff this year. Um, so we get some donations that people just people know that we're doing this and they just give us stuff. Um, so the money will cover the rental, any supplies that we might need and um, then anything extra we've used it to rent out space or to do bigger bigger parties. So for example, any extra at the end of our this term, 
will be put towards renting um, like a gymnastics place for our, our Christmas party. So we'll do like a potluck, similar like how you'd rent it out for like a birthday party. We would rent ours out for like a Christmas party kind of thing. So that's what we we do. Um, if you're doing one like a academic co-op where you need to buy a curriculum, that might be an extra cost that you have to think about, or you might need to have like, you might have a supply charge. Um, but it really depends on like what you need to cover your costs. Because obviously like, it's not fair for one person to go in debt. So like you need to be able to cover your costs. So what do we need to bring? So again, this is going to depend completely on your co-op, but typically for us, we, things we need to bring or that I think of bringing every week, uh, we need to bring water because there's not a lot of potable water. There's like a, a Culligan jar or a bottle thing there, like a water dispenser thing, but there's not like the water in the building because it's like a community based building and it's in the woods. There isn't, um, you can't drink the water. You can wash with it and stuff, but you can't drink it. So we need to bring water because our kids spend so much time outdoors at our clubhouse. Uh, we always need to remember to bring outdoor gear, which is more of a hassle than you might think when you are having to try to convince your kids that like, I know you don't want to bring your rubber boots right now, but you probably should bring your rubber boots because you're probably going to want them in 35 minutes when your running shoes are soaking wet because you were running through the puddles. Like, or like, I know you don't want to wear those. Like, I want you to wear the big mittens. I know you, it's warm in the car right now, but like once we get there and you go play outside, those little thin woolen mittens are going to be soaked through in no time. Wear the big mittens. Um, so, we need to bring outdoor gear because of where our co-op co-op is we the kids play outside a lot and so we are always making sure they bring outdoor gear um yeah and then we might bring extra supplies depending on what the activity of the week is so there's often like a suggested activity so like last week was basketball and so my kids grabbed their basketball and brought their basketball right if it's a board game day we might bring a board game with us you know, whatever, whatever is needed. Um, and then typically we bring a snack kind of once a month because by the time every, if everyone kind of brings something once a month, the kids end up with two or three little snacky things to pick from and that works out well. So like it might end up being like one person brings like a crate of oranges. Somebody else brought like some little cups with a uh, dip and carrot sticks somebody brought some muffins like and then the next week those people would bring a snack and someone else would bring something different like we just kind of try to bring a snack so everyone has at least something and it seems to work out pretty well it's not a sign up or anything it's just really chill and then um the only thing that we sign up for is if we're doing like a potluck so like when we do like a christmas party a halloween party valentine's party i think are the big ones that we do parties for we'll do a potluck party and everybody will bring something and that will be lunch. Like everyone will, we will, instead of having lunch, we'll, before we go, we'll just go and have lunch there. Um, but yeah, it's not much. If you have an academic co-op, you, and it's your turn to teach, you probably will have to bring your own supplies, like for whatever your activity is. Just, uh, yeah. But really like we don't, we don't have to bring that much. Where do you find a co-op? This is a tricky one because I think a lot of people want to be able to find co-ops easier. And there's not really like a database of co-ops, unfortunately. Um, so I find the best place to find co-ops typically is your local Facebook group. It's a great place to find a local co-op. The other option that I see people actually have more success with is if you sign up and take a homeschool class in your area, like a homeschool during the day, jujitsu class, gymnastics class, art class, whatever it is class, I find a lot of people make connections in those classes and end up being able to either find a co-op better or they'll connect with a couple of people and start a co-op because you don't really need that many people to start a co-op. That's exactly how we found our co-op. We were taking gymnastics. We ended up connecting with the mom who runs this co-op and we went and checked it out. And then we've just been attending basically on a weekly basis for the last two and a half or three years. So sometimes you just it's one of those things where it is tricky definitely reach out in your local facebook groups and see who's running one um try if you're visiting at a homeschool class ask around there because those parents will be in the know and um if you can't find one 
make one. Which leads to the next question of how hard is it to start a co-op? Starting a co-op is as easy or as hard as you want to make it. Basically, all you need to run a social co-op is three to five families who agree to meet on a regular basis and a place to do so. That's all you need to start a social co-op. Um, if you want to start an academic co-op, like I said, it takes a little bit more time because you have to do a little bit more planning. You have to figure out a curriculum. You have to find a curriculum everyone is going to agree on and be happy to teach, which is usually where people get stuck. So if you don't have a co-op in your area, I highly suggest you start with a social co-op. You can always add a academic element later on. Um, but in terms of like, you just want to get your kids to meet other people and hang out on a regular basis, a social co-op is way easier. And then finally, I'm just going to explain what our co-op looks like and how it's run. And just to like give you an idea of how simple this can be, because the lady who runs our co-op is a genius and she is just an incredible homeschool mom who not only homeschools her six children, um, but also works part-time and runs a farm and our co-op. So like it is very doable, apparently. <laughs> it's like, so um, I just want to give you a rundown of kind of how she organizes our co-op and how we do it. Because I think sometimes that just like takes the all the theoretical stuff out of the question. You just see how it happens. Basically, we have found, it started out at a church nearby that she was renting space from. And then we kind of outgrew the little room because when she started, I think she said she had five or six families. Um, we now have 18 that attend pretty regularly. Um, and we have 30 something that are on the, the mailing list. So it's grown over the last three years. It's definitely a, if you build it, they will come kind of situation. Yeah, our first our first meeting this year, we had 45 children at the group, which is crazy. Um, so basically we, uh, we moved from the church to a clubhouse, which we are loving. Um, it is got some woods on one side and the river's there. So as long as the kids don't go past and the woods is pretty, it's quite a bit of woods first, but there is a river. So it's kind of low. So we have our clubhouse and then because it's like a community area, they have put in a lot of things. So there's a baseball field, basketball courts. There's another little field area. There's a playground. And then there's this like community clubhouse building, which has like a small kitchen where you can like boil water basically uh it's not a very functional kitchen but it's a kitchen you can wash some dishes um and then just get out of the cold because it's canada we need to be able to do that and so we enjoy it because we have lots of options of especially outdoor space so she rents the community the the community clubhouse for whatever it is for the year and then uh from there she basically plans per term and gives us like a rundown of like, for example, this year we meet on Thursday. So every Thursday, here's what the general activity is. So it is a suggested activity. Like for example, last week was basketball because we have the basketball courts. The kids brought their basketballs. They were invited to play basketball. I think a few of the boys chose to play basketball. Most of the kids decided to do something different. Um, they actually all went to make a movie together so they all ran off into the baseball field and started working on this movie thing. So there's an activity that is there. It is always like an in like a voluntary activity. They don't have to participate. Um, so sometimes it's something like basketball. Sometimes it's like a craft. Sometimes um, it's like a scavenger hunt. There's there's different a different activity every week. Sometimes we do a seasonal activity, like we'll do Christmas cards or Valentine's cards. Valentine's we usually do over two two weeks so one week will be like everyone makes a little paper bag to decorate and then the next week will be our valentine's party we have the potluck and everyone brings in like a valentine's and puts them in all the bags um so that's like a two-week activity christmas they do cards ornaments and then a big hit we bring in a projector they come in their pajamas and we watch like the grinch i'm not even kidding that is like one of their biggest hits um, other popular things that we'll do, they can, we do show and tell. That's always a hit, especially the younger ones. They love to show like their latest toy. We'll usually do that twice a year. Um, a comedy show. I've never seen kids hook onto an activity more than they did on a comedy show. So they all came with a couple jokes and told jokes with a little like microphone. They did that for over an hour. 
like 30 kids sitting down listening to each other laughing and telling jokes fantastic we've also done a book share where everyone brought their favorite book that they're reading and they like shared it with the group as to like what they liked about it why they liked it um and then it gave some of the other kids ideas of what they could read which was like oh, alexi inspired this boy to read the last kids on earth series her friend inspired her to try like this horse book like so they kind of like all find different things to read which is kind of nice we've done board game days we've done lego challenge days um yeah so we do all kinds of activities and we get a list for example right now it's like this september week one we do this week two is this week three is this week four is this blah 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 blah, blah for the entire term and it's done um she often asks us like hey she asks her kids what are their favorites she asks us parents if you have any ideas for the activities or things that we want to do sometimes a parent will like step up and say like, hey i would love to run this activity and she'll put that in the calendar but for the most part like it's yeah because everything's voluntary and so you never know how many kids are going to like hook on to an activity we have a lot of fun doing this um so then we typically meet around one o'clock it's not super strict sometimes we're a little bit late, I'm not gonna lie. We're, we're not often late. We're usually like right on time. Um, although the last two weeks we have been late. So yeah, but usually most people are there by 1.30. And so if we are doing an activity, we'll kind of start it and all like offer it up at 1.30 and then the kids will do it or they won't. And we usually lock up between like three and 3.30. So if they wanna do the activity, they do the activity. If they don't, they, find a friend and do something else. Um, our kids do spend a lot of time outdoors, even in the winter, because the clubhouse is quite small. So there's not always like the space for them. So they'll come in, they'll warm up, they'll put their stuff on and go back outside. They'll come in, they'll warm up, they'll put their stuff back on and go outside. Um, and so even on a, on a winter day, they'll the group as a whole will probably spend at least an hour outdoors. Um, and if it's a nice day, they'll, they won't go inside. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what our, our co-op looks like. That is how co-ops typically run. And I hope that this shows you that co-ops are out there. There are different kinds of co-ops and that running and starting a co-op is not that hard. If you don't have one in your area, you can start one quite easily. Um, I have friends who are starting one kind of more in the city because we're on the outskirts and they're using literally this exact model. And I think they already had 12 families show up. So definitely if you don't have one in your area, they're not that hard to start. And if you do have one in your area, I highly recommend that you go check it out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Um, make sure that you subscribe, click the bell, get notifications, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next week. Bye.